to get invited back a second time unless it's to apologize for the first time. So I don't really know unless it fits to John. I stayed with his family the first time I came. I can hardly believe it was three years ago last February. So those of you who I did meet last time can sigh another <laughs> sigh of knowing that another three years and a half have slipped by. It's really great to be with you again tonight and as I've been praying what the Lord would have me to come and share tonight, a word keeps coming back and it's a word that's been with me now. It seems for several uh, chapter dinners that I've been to recently and it's the word encourage. It's pretty obvious I think that the Lord is wanting to encourage the chapters and is also wanting to encourage each of us as individuals. And as I've been really looking to it, uh, about what he would have me to say tonight, again and again this word encourage has come back. And I've got this assurance, especially motoring over today, that the Lord is going to encourage every one of us, without exception, everyone is going to encourage for something. So I'm really grateful to God, and I'm excited about that tonight. I've mentioned before that very often I get things wrong. And it has been known for a um, president to ring up and say, um, why are you not at our dinner? You were booked today. Um, sometimes things go adrift. Um, I work for the Ministry of Defence at Bicester. I live in Oxfordshire, although that uh, is not uh, disguised by my accent. I was born in Berkshire. I still live in the same place, but we moved our county boundaries, and so we just slipped poshly into Oxford. Um, but I still work in Bicester for the Ministry of Defence. My job is moving uh, units, army units, from one part of the world to another. So if, when you're in Chelmsford or anywhere around in the locality, you ever see a soldier or two looking a little bit lost, it might mean that I've moved his unit and forgot to tell him. <laughs> <coughs> we do have fun in the, in the civil service. Uh, contrary to what people think, uh, very often it can be dull in an office and uh, we just have fun on the telephones. It's not unusual for somebody down the corridor to ring you up and uh, try and pull your leg, pretending to be a high-ranking officer or otherwise. Very often the phone will ring and we'll say Buckingham Palace, and then pick it up, you know, as it's still ringing, and say who we are. You can imagine my consternation one day when I picked it up, and I said, hello, I said Buckingham Palace, and I picked it up and then said where I was, and this very posh lady said, oh, good afternoon, I'm ringing you on behalf of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, and I thought, ah, no, I know I've got a fool here. <laughs> So I said, quite flippantly, that's not Queen Mummy speaking, is it? And there was this little silence, and she said, Good afternoon. I'm ringing you on behalf of Her Majesty <laughs> Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. And I thought, now I know we never get calls from the Queen Mother. So I said, uh, oh, I said, and how is Queen Mummy? And, uh, and uh, this voice said, Good afternoon. <laughs> I'm ringing you from Clarence's house. And I said, oh, yes. She said, it's about the Christmas puddings. And I said, oh, yes. I thought, no, I know this is a joke. Christmas puddings in Clarence's house. So I said, well, if Queen Mummy's got a few Christmas puddings to throw about, she can throw some this way. It's getting near Christmas. And she said, I think I should explain. I'm a lady, and she gave her name. I'm the personal lady-in-waiting to Her Majesty. I don't know if you know, but Her Majesty annually makes a gift of Christmas puddings to two units of the British Army. And this year Her Majesty has chosen, and she named the two units, and we want to know where they are so that we can arrange for the Christmas puddings to be sent. You get all that feeling, don't you? There's something genuine in this, after all. <laughs> and so I began to give her the information that she was requested, and uh, the word trickled through and got to the brigadier, and I was called up, and he thought it was quite funny. <laughs> I'm glad he did, he's got a sense of humour. 
he said, well, one thing is certain, any chance you might have thought no BE has come down the drain, <laughs> but there's every chance you'll get a Christmas pudding. <laughs> So see, sometimes I get it wrong. I got it wrong going home from the Ministry of Defence one night. I do flexi time and I go uh, usually in the car, which means I can start late and finish early or go early and finish late so I can accumulate the time to get off on days like today. But this particular day I went on the coach, which is provided, and I got off the bus in our village, which is between Wantage and Abingdon-on-Thames, about 10 miles west of Oxford, and as I'm walking down the road and I'm swinging my briefcase, this young lad about 18 is walking down the road in front of me. And to my consternation, he just seemed to buckle up and lay on the side of the road. And I thought, cracky, that kid's had a heart attack. Or he's having a fit. And so I threw down my case and I dashed over there and very gently I sort of turned him over. And he looked up into my face and he said, What do you think you're doing? <laughs> and I said, are you okay? He said, of course I'm all right. I said, well, you just crumpled up and lay there. I thought you'd had a heart attack or a fit or something. He said, I'm from the water board and I'm listening for a leak. <laughs> <laughs> I was glad I didn't give him the kiss of life. I might have been arrested. <laughs> so you see, sometimes I get it wrong. <laughs> but tonight, I've got it dead right. I've got it dead right tonight when I've come to share with you a wonderful Lord, and as I said, a Lord tonight, who is here because he wants to encourage every one of us. And you will know, as the Lord just gives you the word, you'll know which is your little bit of encouragement. Well, for a start, I wasn't brought up in a Christian home. I was born at Uffington in the Vale of the White Horse, the village of Tom Brown, of Tom Brown School Days, if you ever read the book. And uh, my dad was a farm labourer. He was a very violent one. He couldn't keep a job because of his violence. And my earliest recollections was that he used to beat up my mum and me unmercifully. And I was always covered in bruises and I was always sort of beaten to pulp. And I used to be hived off round different members of the family to sort of go undercover from time to time. Because I was so scared of my dad, um, I had this terrible nerve problem, which resulted in me having a nerve rash from head to foot and a very bad impediment in my speech. I couldn't say a sentence without stammering. The problem was I used to lay in bed at night and pull the blankets up over my head and try and shut out the screams of my mum as he used to beat her up, and often wondering if I was going to be next. Because he had such a temper, it meant he couldn't keep a job. As he worked on farms, he'd go and work there for a week or a couple of weeks, and then he'd, his temper would get the better of him, and he would either bash up the farmer whom he worked for, or, and get the sack, or he would be given notice because of his violence. Because we lived in tied farm cottages, it meant that we never had a home more than a week or a couple of weeks. Because when he lost his job, we lost our home. And so for the first 14, 15 years of my life, we existed like gypsies. We just moved from village to village, farm to farm, from one little hamlet to another. Very often we didn't have a bathroom. It was a case of having a bath in an old tin bath in front of the fire. We used to have a toilet at the bottom of the garden. They used to have taps outside and used to, in the winter, have to put straw around the tap and set fire to the straw to thaw the tap out before you could even draw any water. Some cottages would be miles across fields with the farm. There'd be no electricity and we'd have the old oil paraffin lamps and so forth. So that really was my background. When I was eight, I went to a... A village where there was a young lad going to Sunday school and he said to me Ken would you like to come to Sunday school with me and I said yeah okay because I'd never been to school um, I discovered that um, because we moved so frequently every week or a couple of weeks from village to village we would get to a school my mum would take me along and put my name down to start at the school 
and they would say, well, start at the beginning of next term, the term's nearly finished, but by the time the next term came round, or the next month, of course, we'd moved miles away, and I didn't have any schooling. But when this little boy said, do you want to come to Sunday school? I thought, this is great, because now I'll be able to read and write and do sums. Well, when we got along to this little village Sunday school, um, I found it very weird. They were singing hymns and choruses, which, of course, I didn't understand. I'd never heard about God. And when they put their hands together and closed their eyes and appeared to be speaking to somebody that wasn't present, I thought, this is very weird. And I just wanted to get out of the place. Now, I can't remember much that went on that day, except the old Sunday school teacher said, remember, children, that God always answers prayer. And that's the first encouragement I want to give you friends here tonight, to know that God always, every time, answers your prayer. Sometimes he answers with yes, and you get your request immediately or almost immediately. Sometimes God answers with a no. And God knows what is best. If he answers with no, Father knows what he's doing. And sometimes he answers with wait. The time is not ripe now. But he does answer every prayer. Well, we went back, I went back to where we were living at this time. Three cottages and a farm miles from anywhere. And it being Sunday afternoon, I remembered I wasn't to go in. Because on Sundays, after Sunday lunch, my dad used to sleep. And that used to be his sort of quiet afternoon. And you wouldn't dare wake him up. And I knew if I did, I'd be beat up. And so I decided I'd go round this new farm and see what was there. And as I wandered around, I came across two big closed-in gates, big doors. And I thought, childlike, I wonder what's behind here. So I opened the doors, and as the door swung open, I found myself looking in at a big farmyard and a lot of cows in it. Well, they took one look at me and began to trot toward me. I'm scared. I turned round and I ran away and left the doors open. And consequently, all the cows got out, and they walked across the road and began to trample down a big field of corn. Now, I'm really scared. And I knew that when my dad found out, I'd be beat up again. So I did what a lot of people do when they get a crisis. They pray. And I remembered that that Sunday school teacher said, God always answers prayer. And I wanted a prayer answered. And so I threw myself down under a pear tree in this field. And I prayed a very simple prayer. I remember it well. I said, God, I believe you. Please do me a favor. Please, God, get the cows out of the corn and back in the yard so my dad won't know. And I was really breaking my heart. And when I stood on my feet, that day I witnessed my first miracle because every cow came out of the corn, went back into the, fi it went back into the yard, and I couldn't see where a blade of corn had been trampled down. Now that day I believed in God. But it was many years after before I realized that the devil also believes in God. And the devil is the enemy of God. And the devil is hell-bound. And he is determined to take as many to hell with him as he possibly can. And truly, he had got me well in mind. Because the devilish influence on my life just got worse after this lovely incident that I had with the Lord. Because as I grew older, I grew more like my dad. And people said, like father, like son. I had a terrible, filthy mouth. I still had this awful stutter. My nerve rash got bad. I was still scared of my dad. But as we kept moving round, I was growing up also with this inherited temper. And I, too, used to fly off the handle and used to beat people up. Unfortunately, I used to take on gangs that were big gangs, single-handed, and was stupid enough to end up always in hospital, being patched and stitched because I didn't have the sense to fight one-to-one. -one. If I went into a new area on my bike, 
to see what was around that area, I invariably got lost because I couldn't read a signpost to know how to get back. And of course it was impossible. I didn't have the money anyway to go by bus, but I wouldn't have been able to have read a bus timetable anyway. As the years went on, I got worse. My temper got worse, my fighting got worse. And by the time I was 15, I was really fighting my dad as well. So my mum had the two of us to contend. And in the meantime, seven years after me, I had a little sister. When we got 15, my mum and dad's marriage got very rocky. And my mum said that she just couldn't go on with this gypsy way of living. And if we didn't get a council house, she just couldn't carry on. Well, looking back, I'm sure God had a hand in it because we did get a council house. And it meant that we now had a permanent home, and for the first time in 15 years, we could unpack all our furniture and put everything out where it needed to be. My dad still went on changing his job, although he mellowed down in the latter years of his life, and he died in 1971. I'm single, and I still live with my mum in the village that we went to. Well, 15. Time to leave school, if you've ever been to school, and to get a job. Not easy when you've got no education whatsoever and you can't read or write. But I was fortunate to get a job at the international stores. That was a grocer's shop in Wantage, four miles from where I lived. And that meant cycling there from West Hanny, the village where I live, to Wantage in the morning and back at night. On the very first day, as I was cycling to work, a girl came along beside me and was cycled along, and she introduced herself as working at the chemist shop near the international stores in town. And she began to witness to me about Jesus, and that really got my back up. I didn't want to be spoken to about Jesus. I didn't want to be taken up with somebody that, to my mind, had got religious mania. I didn't understand God and I didn't want to understand God. I didn't want her trying to tell me how I should live my life. If she wanted to go to chapel, fair enough, don't thrust it down my throat. And I just wanted nothing whatsoever to do with her or her God. And at night, coming back home from the shop, I told her so. But she said, that never stops me praying for you, and that will never stop me being concerned for you. Another encouragement, somebody that you've been praying for. Maybe it's a husband or a wife or a son or a daughter, a mum or a dad, a brother or a sister, a friend. Never give up praying. I thank God for the faithful prayers of that girl who prayed every single day and witnessed every day for two years, although I called her everything from a dog to a devil. I insulted her, was rude, and I swore at her. She never, ever gave up praying for me. When I was 17, my dad and I had a fight, and I got knocked out. And when I came to, I decided I wanted to just get away from him as far as I could. And I felt hurt, and I was looking for a shoulder to cry on. It was a cry for help. I'd already tried to commit suicide. I'd taken a massive amount of tablets, the doctor said, was enough to kill an ox. And it was a miracle, miracle, that I survived. Obviously, God then had a plan in my life. This Sunday night, I decided I'd go round and find out this girl. She is the only one that had never laughed at me. She had never made any comments and the only one that ever listened or wanted anything to do with me. When I got to her home, she wasn't there. Sunday night, she'd gone to the village chapel. And so I decided I would go round to the chapel and once and for all, because I was full of vengeance and hate now, I would show them Christian people just what a load of hypocrites they were I would cat call through the hymns. I'd make the service a mockery. I would tear it to shreds. I would embarrass this girl in front of her friends and get, for once and for all, this church off my back. I got round to the chapel, and you go up steps to the chapel, and as I got to the bottom of the steps, I looked up, 
and there was this enormous lady at the top of the steps. She took one look at me and smiled and she came down like the angel Gabriel. And she put her arms around me and she kissed me. But well, that threw me for a start. <laughs> And she whisked me inside, and there were all these young people there, teenagers and all, and they said how pleased they were to see me. And I was thrown. I had never seen such love and concern and friendship. I'd, I'd never experienced anything like that. And I was touched. I realized there was something about those people. I couldn't put my finger on it, but they had obviously got something that was missing in my own life. And I was so touched by the love of those people. Here is another encouragement. Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you show love one to another. Today my ministry is to prostitutes, to down and outs, the homeless, problem teenagers, um, drug addicts, glue sniffers, alcoholics. I go into the ghettos, I go into the very dregs of society. I tell you, it's not going and preaching to them chapters of St. Matthew or Mark or Luke or John that arrests them in the first instance. It's showing them love, being concerned that they've got no home, trying to find them a home finding out that they've not had a meal, they've had no food for three or four days and they're starving, and giving them some food. I believe that you have to look after the, the physical before you can ever start to think of the spiritual. And listen, listen, because they have something vital to say. Show love. It was love that spoke to me in this church. And I responded to love. People respond to love. And as I went back week after week after week and I listened to that old faithful preacher, I learned what love really was. And that is that Jesus loved me more than anybody could ever love me. And he loved me so much that he was willing to die for me. Now, in my estimation, you've got to love somebody a whole lot if you're willing to put your life on the line and suffer and bleed and die for them. Would you do that for a member of your family, your husband, your wife, your children tonight? You might say, yes, I think I could. But could you do it for somebody that hates you? For somebody that's got no time for you, that ridicules you? But that's what Jesus did for me. And going back week after week, I listened to the message. And in my 17th year of my life, on the first Sunday in July, I sat in the pew and I closed my eyes as the preacher was preaching. And it was just as though I was lifted up above the chapel. And I could see Jesus about 18 inches in front of me. And he, had, he was on the cross and he had a filthy face. His face was all covered in dust. There were two white lines through the dust where the tears from his eyes had rolled down through the dirt on his face. He had a swollen lip and a big bruise under his eye. His eyes were closed. His hands were nailed to the wood and so were his feet. I could see the gash in his side and I could see the blood on his forehead running down from those crown of thorns, from the thorns in the crown. And as I was watching, as I was looking, he suddenly opened his eyes and he looked right into mine and he said, Ken, with a smile. I sat in the pew and I broke my heart. I wept like a baby. All my hardness, my fighting, my bitterness, I could feel it all welling up and just spilling out. One look at Jesus, one look at that smile, one look at the pain in his face, the way he spoke my name, he said one word. And as I wept, somebody came in and they put their hand on my shoulder and they said, friend, we believe today the Lord has spoken to you. And I could only nod. And they said, we believe today you want to open your heart and invite him in. And I could only nod. 
I didn't want Jesus on the cross. I wanted him inside. That power, that look, that peace, that acknowledgement. I needed Jesus. And I realized for the first time that he was hanging on that cross for all the sins I'd committed. Stealing from the shop, selling what I stole, getting more in, in, in selling stolen goods than I got in wages. My filthy life, my filthy language, my fighting, my thieving. And I could see all there was on Jesus. He was suffering for those sins and shedding his blood to cleanse my soul. I saw it as clear as the day. And I truly repented. There is no salvation without repentance. I truly repented of what I had done. Because I knew that it was my sins that had put Jesus on that cross. He suffered there for a sinner. And I wanted him as my saviour. And so this friend said, pray. Well, it's not easy to pray when you've got an impediment in your speech. But haltingly, I simply said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, and forgive me and come into my heart and save me and make me a Christian. And praise God he did. You know, one of my youth club boys, status quo mad, plays status quo records everywhere he goes. And when he took a bath, a few, uh, some Sundays, uh, uh, one Sunday as he was taking a bath, listening to status quo, he leaned out of the bath to turn over the record and in a second of time, he was electrocuted. He went from life to death. He touched the electricity and he died. When I touched Jesus by faith, I, who was spiritually, almost physically dead, suddenly became alive. As the power of God, the Holy Spirit, came into my life, I became alive. Now this friend put his hand on my shoulder and he said, Ken, you are now a member of the royal family. He said, your father is king, king of kings and lord of lords. And you now are a child of the king. A child of the king is a prince or a princess. A member of the royal family. You can walk through this world and you can look it in the eye. You don't have to thieve or be filthy or swear or... You don't have to resort to all the nasties of the world. You can live on a higher plane. Because now you have a royal bounty, a royal father, a royal family, royal privileges, authority, and power. And I want to encourage folk here tonight that are Christians to start living as a member of the royal family and not as a pauper. Because the Lord has given us a place and the position. He's brought us, as the Bible says, from the dunghill, and he set us among princes. And it's time we really began living like him. And then this friend gave me his Bible, and he said, Ken, this is God's written guarantee for everything he says in this Bible. He means it, he can do it, and he will do it. Believe it. Put it into practice in your life. And you will find that God is able to do exceeding abundance more than you can ever, ever ask or think. And I said, thanks for the Bible, but I can't read it. Seventeen and can't read and write. I've never been to school. He said, then when your heavenly father can really do something for you. And he looked, he said, let's look in the guarantee. And he opened the guarantee, the Bible. And he looked at St. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, and he read, Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find, and knock, it shall, shall, Jesus said it shall, be open to you. He said, jokingly, now every guarantee has its small print. Let's have a look at the small print in the guarantee. So he turned over to John chapter 13. And there he read, and Jesus said, now either we believe it or we disbelieve it, Jesus is either a liar or he means what he says. And he says it in the guarantee. Jesus said, whatsoever you ask, Father, 
in my name, says Jesus, I will do it. Now he either means it or he don't. He's either a liar or an imposter or he sticks to his word. It's his guarantee. I didn't wait any longer. I ran home with that old King James copy of the Bible and I threw it on my bed. And I got down on my knees and I prayed. And I said, Lord, I thank you for your guarantee. And I hear in this guarantee, whatsoever I ask, Father, in your name, Lord Jesus, you will do it. I ask for the gift to read. And I ask for the gift to write. That I might read the Bible and share with others what I read. And I might write the whole Bible, Lord. From the first of Genesis to the last of Revelation, copy out the whole Bible so I know what's in it. And I again will be able to share it with people that I meet and I will learn of you. And I opened my Bible and I expected to be able to read. I opened the Bible, it was Luke chapter 5, and the first words I ever read was, launch out into the deep. As I looked at the page, I knew that fishermen had gone fishing, and they were bringing fish to land. I could read. A miracle? I have a miracle working God. I did not go to school. I can read. I could not write. And as I took my pen, I found it difficult to hold the pen. And for six weeks, I prayed, and I got seemingly no answer. I don't know why, but for six weeks, I read instantly I couldn't write for weeks. Until the day I said to the Lord, Lord, I know I'm holding this pen wrong. It doesn't feel right in the hand. And I wanted to write a three because I live at number three. And I said, Lord, I give my pen to you. Lord, I want to write this Bible for you. And as I prayed it, I felt the literal pressure on my hand that moved my hand so I could do with ease a page of threes, the first thing I ever wrote. And having done a page of threes, I found I could do A's and B's and C's and D's and 3's and 4's. I could write. I had made God a promise. I said that if he gave me the gift to read and write, I would write the whole Bible for him. But I didn't have time. You see, overnight, I lost the impediment in my speech. And overnight, my flesh became as clean as a baby. And the people at the shop, and my family, and my neighbours, and the people in our village said, we've never seen anything like it. What has happened? People were scared, and people were frightened to come near me. They thought something supernatural had happened. Praise God it had. God had worked in my life. When I was at the international stores, the manager would say, Son, go down into the warehouse, bring back a box of tins of tomatoes. I want to put a stand out. I'd go down into the warehouse and I'd say, I can't read what's on the boxes. Somebody tell me, which is the box of tomatoes? And they'd say, that's the tomatoes. And I'd struggle up into the shop and I'd put it on the counter. The manager would open it and he'd swear at me and call me an idiot. It'd be tins of peaches. And they'd all be laughing in the warehouse because they knew that I would go up with the wrong thing. I didn't have the next day on the Monday to ask what was tomatoes. The very first thing I ever saw was sultanas. And the manager said, bring sultanas. And I could go and get sultanas because I could read sultanas on the box. Churches from miles around were coming and asking me to give my testimony. Because the word had spread like wildfire. People were coming to look at me as though I was summer in the zoo. Because now I could speak with power and authority and I didn't stammer. And they could see that all my scabs had gone. I could read and I could write. And people said, we've never seen anything like it. In the great guarantee in the Bible... When Jesus performed a miracle, when he raised the dead to life, or somebody who'd been paralyzed for 38 years and he said, get up and walk, we read these words. 
they said, we have seen strange things today. Great amazement came upon them all. They said, we have never seen it in this fashion. And today, Jesus is exactly the same. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when we talk of miracles, when I talk of miracles, about how I was given just like that the gift to read, people look at me with sheer disbelief. And in their mind, often I can tell, they're practically saying, he's a liar. I challenge you to get in touch with my family or come to my village or meet my old friends in the shop. They tell you, you don't have to lie to glorify God. He doesn't look to liars to glorify his name. I made God a promise. If he gave me the gift to read and write, I would write the whole Bible. I didn't have time. Working a six-day week at that shop and every spare minute being called out to go on show as a witness to the power of God, I didn't have time to write the whole Bible. But having made God a promise, and I believe if you make a promise you should keep it, I elected to write the New Testament. Not the whole 66 books of the Bible, but the 27 books of the New Testament. And I've brought it to share with you today. Not a Ken Stallard success story, but for the glory of God, and to encourage you here to see that God takes the T out of Kant, and he makes it tan. I never went to school, but it didn't stop me writing the entire New Testament. Now encourage. Who amongst us has been saying, I can't? I can't get up and give a testimony. I can't work in the church. I can't help in the ladies' meeting, the youth club, the Sunday school. I can't, can't, I can't. I can't walk, I can't sing, I can't. In the guarantee, the Apostle Paul writes this, I can, I can, do all things through Christ. All the things in life I couldn't do, I found I can do through Christ who strengthens me. And he can do the same for you. I'm nobody special to God at all. You're just as special. God is not a respecter of persons. And the miracles he does in my life, he can do in yours. I want to encourage you to see that tonight. And so I had a handwritten copy of the New Testament. What do I do with it? I prayed, Lord, what would you have me to do? And as I prayed, I was led to a verse. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my name's sake. And I couldn't believe or understand just what God was saying. But looking back over 20 odd years, I can see the hand that is planned. I have been sent twice around the world. And the Lord kept his promise. And given me the opportunity to witness personally to members of a royal family in Buckingham Palace. Four times at the White House to a different American president, to heads of state around the world, film stars, sports stars, people in very high places. And as I have witnessed to them of the things of God, I've asked them if they would sign their name in the book. And every signature in the book is a testimony of a meeting of a person that has heard something about God leave it on the table you'll probably say at the end we had a boring old speaker tonight but he had an interesting book you can have a look at it but every one of those are in there are special and I could share with you tonight some many many secrets of things that have been told me of people very high very high in the world presidents members of the royal family secrets that they have shared Agonies that they go through, tortured minds, tears. But the joy of being able to tell them of someone who loves them, even my Jesus. And I want to share with you tonight just one, because it thrills my heart. All the signatures in the book is the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. I had a call from Claridge's 
The Duchess had a friend, and I'd prayed for this friend, because this friend had an incurable disease. And we've got the Lord who can cure the incurables. And he cured, as a result of prayer, this person. And this person was so thrilled of it that at a very high society party, she spoke of it to the Duchess of Windsor. The Duchess of Windsor sent a message. Would I go and visit her at Claridge's in London? And as I got there, she said, I want to share with you a secret. Oh, many times they want to share a secret. And she said, it's this. The world doesn't know that His Royal Highness is going blind. He's come into the London Clinic for a special operation, but our doctors have told us in Paris it's impossible. It's only an appeasement, just to please him, because he's so worried. But he'll never see better again and within a very short time, he will be blind. And as you prayed for this friend of mine, and that friend had a wonderful healing, I wonder if I dare ask you to pray for His Royal Highness. I said, Madam, on the 9th of July, 1961, I was riding pillion on a motorbike. My little friend didn't have an affair in the tyres. And when we were going at 60 miles an hour, the back tyre split and I catapulted and landed on my face in the middle of the road. I was literally scooped up and taken to the Nuffield Department of Plastic Surgery at the Churchill Hospital in Oxford. And there Mr. Peets, the resident surgeon, said to my parents and myself that I would be very badly disfigured and very badly scarred for the rest of my life. But the good thing was that Mr. Wilkie, a Canadian plastic surgeon at Stoke Mandeville, had agreed to come and perform the first of the series of operations on my face. And although I would be disfigured and badly scarred, I would have to learn to live with the scars. They would do the best they could. I'd got the best treatment available. I went back to the written guarantee. You see, I believed my father, who had saved my soul, was also capable of healing my body. Because in the written guarantee, it says, I am he that healeth thee, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. Now he means it, or he's a liar. I tell you tonight, God is no liar. And I pray and others pray that I might be healed. The day came when Mr. Wilkie said, we'll have a look at the first cut uncovering of this operation. And he took a square inch out of the plaster on the right cheek, looked through with his microscope, and said, I don't believe this. And began to take a bit more and a bit more until the rest of the plaster was taken off in two big lumps. And he said, gee, it's a miracle. Because he sees more or less what you see today. The Lord had done a good job. And I said to the Duchess, you see, we have a Lord who is able to keep his word, who is able to do exceeding abundant, more than we can ever ask a thing, and is able to heal. And now she's in tears. And she just held my hand like a pathetic little girl. And she said, please pray. And I prayed. And as I left, she said, unfortunately, I cannot sign the book. The very strict Buckingham Palace rule prevents any member of the royal family from signing autographs such as this. I told her that that didn't mean anything to me. I was quite happy to have been able to witness to her of the Lord, and I believe that God would do a good work. So I came home, just thanking the Lord for another chance of being able to witness to that dear lady of the things of God. A few weeks later, I got another call, this time from Buckingham Palace. Would I go back to Claridge's? I didn't know why. 
And when I got there, I was greeted by the Duke himself, who came and threw his arms round me and swung me off my feet and said, I just had to meet you. The Duchess told me how you came, and she told you about my operation and how you so beautifully prayed for me. And I said, Sir, how was the operation? He took off his dark sunglasses that he was wearing this day, and he said to quote, I have never seen better. The Lord had given him a healing. And he said, I am so grateful to you that you should come and take the time and be bothered even to pray for us. How can I reward you? And I said, my reward is in heaven. I seek no reward other than to be able to share with you the love of a wonderful Lord. And in tears he said, I know, I know. And he said, the Duchess tells me about that testament and how you've had autographs in it of the people that you have met. You can't have the Duchess in me because of the Buckingham Palace rule. Well, I tell you, rubbish to the rule. I will give you the signature. And then he called the Duchess and he says, come along, sign the card. And there it is, the two together, the king that abdicated and the lady whom he abdicated for, because he was grateful that God had done something for him. And at the conclusion of all my meetings with the rich and the famous, whether it be a president or a princess, when they have signed, under the power of God, I feel compelled to say, as I say here tonight, your autograph is in the book, but is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? And is it on record tonight that you are a... Because that was the days of the two years conscription. I didn't want to go for two years into any old service. I felt I'd like to go into the Air Force. I had only been writing a few weeks. But I wanted to expand my writing. And so I wanted to go into the Air Force as a clerk. And everybody said, I was too ambitious. But I went along to the recruitment and I passed the interview and that written exam. And after square bashing at Padgate, I went down to Hereford on a clerical course. There were 32 of us on the course. Our boss said, I've never had a 100% pass. 50% yes, 75% yes, never 100%. And I want everybody to do well on this course because it's the last one before I get demobbed and I'd like to go out saying I had a 100% pass. How I prayed. How I prayed that the Lord would bless my Air Force career and my work on that course. And truly, every Friday night, as we took the mock test, I was the first to have the highest mark of the whole of that course. And did I use it to witness to those other 31 lads? To make a long story short, when we did the final exam, I was the only one to fail. And 31 of my friends were sent home on embarkation leave. And this officer who was furious with me for being the only one to fail and letting him down on his last course, put me into a cookhouse for scraping out porridge boilers. He said I was stupid, and he swore, and I had a most terrible time. That night, I stay, sat up in my bed, in my billet. There were 16 in each of two billets, and now there were 15 empty beds in mine, and mine was the only bed occupied. And I cried as the rain poured on the roof, the old tin roof that night of that billet. And in my heart, I said, God, you let me down. I witnessed for you, just when I needed you most, you forsook me. I asked you to help me, and I am the only one to fail. And all those that blaspheme, all those that got no time for you, they are the ones that prosper. Lord, why did you do this for me? I hate it in that cookhouse. What's going to happen to me? And the next day a sergeant came to see me. 
and he said, this is a miracle. He said, you know, the boss realizes that you've got potential and he's asked me to give you some private tuition. And what's more, he's got permission from the air ministry for you to take an exam all on your own. Now, I have never known before or since anybody that's had a private tutor or anybody that's had an exam just for one. But then I'm one of the king's kids. I'm a member of the royal family. God has got his children's interest at heart. Again, to cut another long story short, I passed that exam with flying colors that made the others look stupid with their marks and my boss said I cannot understand lad first you fail miserably then you pass with such a high mark I said what's happening to me am I going to 401 Air Stores Park at Eindhoven in Holland where they have gone he said no you are being sent to 402 Air Stores Park and that's at Wildenrath in West Germany and so off to West Germany I went as a single airman a beautiful camp Everything there was marvelous. And on my first day, I said to the commanding officer, my only regret is that my 31 mates are over there in Eindhoven. And I miss them. And he said, well, they're closing Eindhoven down. The air ministry is closing that station. And all the kit, the stores, the wagons, the accounts are to be transferred here. And sure enough, within a couple of months, my 31 friends, all the equipment, the lorries, the kit, the stores, the vehicles, all came to Wildenrath. But the difference was, there wasn't any clerical vacancies. And every one of those clerks were regraded. Some to scrape ice off the runways, some to put the tires on lorries, some to go into store sheds. One night the boy in the bed next to me said, Ken, how is it? that you are the only one to fail the clerical course and the only one to get a clerical job. I tell you why. Because I'm one of the king's kids. And I encourage you to see that tonight. That sometimes God has to hold you back. He has to say no. He has to say wait because he wants you to have the best and not second best. And I want to encourage somebody tonight who failed an important exam, who didn't get a job, who got turned down at an interview, who didn't get promotion. They brought somebody from beneath you and promoted them over you. They brought somebody in from outside and you have said, he's a twit. I can do the job far better. They expect me to teach him and I've been doing this job for years. And you have moaned and you have groaned and you have complained. Child of God, don't complain. Praise God. Just praise God for putting you in that circumstances, for bringing somebody in. Because if you'll trust him, you will find that he'll turn your extremity into his opportunity. Now, I say this not to boast tonight, but if you came to my village and asked the people, they would tell you this is true. That some of the most heartbreaking things happen to me. And people say, Ken, we can't understand it. If it happened to me, what happened to you, I'd give up. It would break my heart. And yet when this catastrophe and when this crisis comes, you seem to be at your best. You seem to laugh and you get all excited and you joke about it. How can you do it? What's your secret of success? I haven't got any secret of success. But I have found over nearly 30 years that when the Lord brings me to an extremity, it's exciting. Because I'm going to say, Lord, what are you going to do? I know something tremendous is going to come out of it. Let me give you an example. Just before Christmas, I'm going down to a full gospel dinner. Down in Wales, six miles from home, 60 miles an hour. Lovely long straight road. It was just as though hands came under my car. My car got tossed. And as I turned upside down and I went over into the back seat and I felt the seat belt come up around my throat and it felt like I was being choked, it went over a second time. And at that moment, I felt this warmth and this peace. 
And it was as though I was in a great purple and yellow light. And it was warm. And it was just as though I was carried along. And I was going at a terrific speed upside down. And then this terrific jolt upside down across the ditch, which should have broken my neck as the seatbelt was wrapped around my neck. And I wasn't even conscious any longer that it was there. And the next thing I know was feeling cold air. And hands underneath me, and I'm being lifted out. And two young lads had stopped in a car, and I get up onto my feet. And my first words are, I'm going to Wales. And they said, not in that, you're not. (laughs) (laughs) And at that moment, a police car just happened to be in that area, stopped, and the policeman runs to the car, and he says, oh, I can't think what he's like in there. I said, it's me, I'm all right. And he looked in amazement, and he said, somebody up there must love you. See the tree? That car went upside down, heading for that tree, and just as it got to the tree, he said, it looks like a hand has pushed it round the tree. It did. Oh, my father's hand was on the car. The policeman said, I can put my thumb on the tree and my finger on the car, And you miss death, instant death by that. I told the policeman, underneath were everlasting arms. He said, you've not got a bruise, should you go to hospital? I said, I don't want to waste the hospital time. I haven't got a bruise or a mark or a scratch. But then we read in the guarantee, when the men walked in the furnace, they were not burned. And their God is my God. And I went home so excited. And my mum said, these boys took me home. My mum said, I thought you were going to Wales. I said, God's got another plan. And I was so excited, I couldn't sleep that night. I rang up the dinner and said I was sorry I was going. They were cross. And the next day, the headlines of the Oxford Mail was, Miracle Escape for Evangelists. And the following tea time, I got a phone call. And the man said on the phone, we've been praising God for your deliverance. And I said, well, it was marvelous. I've been praising God ever since too. He said, but now you've written your car off. And I said, yes. He said, do you know Miller's Garage in West Chalo Village? And I said, yes. He said, that's my garage. Could you get along there on Saturday morning? I said, yes. He said, there'll be a brand new car waiting for you. It will be taxed for a year and it will be filled up with petrol. Please collect it. And I said, who's speaking? Who is it? Who is it? And all I got was the dialing tone. Now, I don't know who gave me that brand new car. But I know who sent it. Because Father promised in the written guarantee, my God shall supply all you need, not all you want. And I needed a car to get out for him. My God shall supply all you need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Time is gone. I'll just very quickly bring you up to date with a couple of incidents. And when I came out of the Air Force, the Lord, through a whole series of miracles, sent me to a little village where I found some homeless kids. And finding a room for them to meet in and ministering to their physical needs, I was amazed to find the following week about 30 from about as many miles radius had come in to be fed. And the Lord taught me not only to give spiritual food, but the physical food. And I never dreamt that in 20 years, That work would have spread and expand and expand and expand and go out into three areas so that most of my time is going out to the young people. If you can imagine being called out in the middle of the night, we think Chalk is dying. We think Mary's bleeding to death. Could you come... And stop two boys trying to give a girl an abortion with battery acid. Can you come to my friend? She's tried to give herself an abortion. And she's in a bath of blood and water. She's given herself an abortion with a knitting needle. Can you come straight away? 
stories are endless. You can imagine going round the dark streets, the back streets in Oxford, and the boy says, leave your car there. Tiptoe down this bit. Come round the corner. Look up and down the road. Nobody's coming. So he pulls up some boards that are over a window of an old house that was burnt out. We go under the boards walk from rafter to rafter carefully in the dark because the floorboards are gone. Many is the time I've fallen through the ceilings in the dark. Get to the far end of the room and there's a ladder going down into the basement. Go down the ladder. You slide down about the last eight feet because I've broken the rungs off to have a fire down there to keep warm. You can imagine a main line injecting, taking pills, drunk, drunk all kinds of sexual perversions, broken hearts, broken homes, dens of iniquity and dens of misery, fleas and vomits and urine. But the place where the Lord longs to dwell and make his presence felt. Over the years, mine has been the joy of taking the light of the world into the darkness of the ghettos and seeing the response of these young kids. The Lord has sent me into Belfast. I've known what it is to miss being blown up by a bomb by seconds and dodge the bullets, yes, in the streets, behind the Iron Curtain, in the underground church, Bible smuggling. It's been an exciting Christian life. It's had its exciting moments, it's sad moments, it's heartbreaking moments, it's triumphs. But my heart's where the kids are. And the joy of seeing them come through to a full salvation. And knowing the joy of being taken from the guttermost to the uttermost. Have a look at the photographs before you go. Every kid in these pictures is either an alcoholic or a drug addict blue sniffer, homeless, hopeless, and I've deliberately chosen the ones who know the peace and joy of knowing Jesus. And the thrill to hear of those that are now on the mission field, and some are serving in churches as deacons and elders, it thrills the heart to see what God can do. And I want to close with just one little message from the youth club. My favorite of all the things that happened in the youth club is to tell you about Kim. And Kim came one night with a paralyzed hand and he said, Ken, I'll never use this hand again because I haven't got anything in my wrist that I need to move my fingers there. I saw my reflection in a glass window in Oxford. I was drunk and I was drugged. And I just lashed out at my image in the glass. The glass broke, and I cut my wrist, and I bled a lot. I remember bleeding, but I don't remember any more until I came round in hospital. Apparently, a young couple had picked him up, took him after to the hospital, the John Radcliffe in Oxford. He said, I'll never use that hand because of the paralysis. And as he was telling me this sad story, and the little tears running down his face, the girl that helps me do the scrambled egg on toast and the beans on toast and the chips said, oh, Ken, the electric cooker has gone out. Sure enough, the little round ring that she had got the saucepan on had died away. The boys all hungry and the girls all hungry, looking with dismay. The boy pulled out the plug, picked up a knife, undid the plug, to mend it, the fuse or whatever it needed said, here's your trouble, mate. All your wires are burnt out in the plug. And at that minute, I felt God was saying to my heart, put the plug in the socket on the right side. We have two sockets. Put the one in the plug in the socket on the right side. And so I found myself saying that. Put the plug in the right socket. You're cracked, mate. The trouble's not in the socket, your trouble's in your plug, your wires are burnt out. Nevertheless, the master retired all night and we took nothing. He said, go back, 
put the net on the right side of the ship. And they said, Nevertheless, Lord, at thy word, at thy word. And they went back. They put the net on the right side of the ship. And they took so many fish that their nets broke. Now, what was different? Experienced fishermen with the same nets in the same boat in the same sea. I tell you what was different. They did it God's way. They were obedient. Put the net on the right side. Put the plug in the right socket. When you do it God's way, God will bless you and make your nets great. The blessings will be overflowing. And that's what he wants you to have. And I encourage you to have tonight. When I got home on my knees, I said, Lord, I thank you for the miracle with the cooker so I could feed all the kids tonight. And the Lord said two words to my heart, Kim's hand. And then I realized God had just given me a visual aid. There was no wires in the plug. And yet God had bypassed that plug. He had put the power in that cooker. If he could do it for a cooker, couldn't he do it for a hand? He could bypass that wrist. He could put a new bit in that wrist. He could heal that wrist and bring the power to the fingers. It suddenly became crystal clear to me. I bought my watch in Canada. And when I bought it, I was given a guarantee. And I was told who the agents were for this watch in England. If it went wrong, I'd take it to the jeweler with the guarantee and it would be repaired. It went wrong. I took it with its guarantee to the agent. He took one look at it, took it off me. He repaired it. I didn't take it to the greengrocers. I didn't take it to the butchers. The watchmaker knows how to put the watch right. When your body goes sick, and my body goes sick, when something goes wrong, the one who made the body is the one to put it right. If he needs to replace a part, he can replace a part in that body. If he needs to heal a part, he can heal a part in that body. It's there in the guarantee. And so I went back the next week and I said, Kim, you saw what God did do with the cooker. Do you believe he can do that for your hand? No. Don't you believe that God could heal you tonight? No. Would you be willing for me to pray with you if you want to? I do want to. So he stuck his fag out in the saucer and he stuck his hand up. And I said, no, come on, put your fingers round my wrist. I can't. Now, Kim, I'm always saying in this club that God takes the tea out of camp and he makes it down. Now, come on. So he begins to be in tears and getting caught. He said, you know what, I can't. I can't. My hand's paralysed, isn't it? I took his hands and I put his fingers on my wrist and I said, now come on, squeeze, I can. And I prayed simply, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, in your guarantee, you said, whatever I ask, Father, in your name, you will do. And in the name of Jesus, I pray that, Lord, you'll give this boy the healing and the res restoration of the power to this hand and wrist, that you may be glorified. This club may know that you are the God of all miracles and this boy might be blessed with the healing that he desires because you said, I will grant the desire of your heart. And I said, now come on, Kim, squeeze my wrist, I can't. And as he's saying, I can't, he could. Because it hurt. And he squeezed and his eyes opened wide and the tears began to flow. And I had to say, kid, let go. <laughs> and he ran across that stage in that old village hall. And he jumped down into the body of the hall. And he ran across to where his mates were eating around the tables. And some were playing drugs and dominoes. And with tears down his little face, sobbing his heart out, grabbing boys by the wrist, he began to wrestle with them, saying, look what I can do. Look what I can do. Look what I can do. And I tell you tonight, beloved, tonight if you here are willing to put a little hand of faith tonight into the hand of my father you can go from this place tonight being also able to say 
I'm a new creature in Christ. And I'm going to prove what I can do as I allow God to do it in me. Let's pray.